Welcome. Thank you, Historical Society, for inviting me to be here today. Um, I have uh, been in this room before, and um, all the programs are always wonderful, so I feel honored to be included among speakers. Um, so I am the Recycling Coordinator, which I think is really a funny name for what I do, because what I really do is help people solve their problems. Um, but of course, I think a lot of jobs are that kind of a job, really. But um, I solve, help people solve you know, a particular problem, the pro problem of consumption, which we have to do to keep ourselves alive and clothed. Um, but it is, it is a problem, and then at some point, the problems shift and change. Our lives change. Our situation changes. Maybe we have to geographically change. Um, so I really love my job because I get to really do that problem solving with residents. We can't solve every problem. There are some problems that just can't be solved. But we try really hard, and I uh, appreciate um, Patsy's uh, mentioning a few of our really successful newer programs like the Swap Shed. So um, I will be talking mostly about um, context, about how we got where we are today. And I can say at the end, I've got a couple of uh, show and tell things up here. So uh, we can, I can happy to ask questions here and tell you about a few other upcoming events if you want to learn more. So, First, we have to get down to the emotional reality of what we're actually talking about today. Because stuff, slash, we're done with it, so it's now waste, has a lot of emotional content to it. And some of us are forever going to save everything that we possibly can. It's just how we're built. Maybe it's, we can blame our parents, maybe, in the therapy session. But maybe it's just the way we were built. Maybe our parents or our siblings were very different from us. And other people are just natural born minimalists. And I don't know quite how one person gets to be one and one person gets to be the other. But I do know that if you love stuff and you wish you were a minimalist, it's very frustrating. It's very hard to stop caring about the things that are around you so much. Um, uh, so these, these phrases might look familiar to some of you. These are some of the reasons that we hear from residents all the time about you know, what how they're interacting with their stuff emotionally. So um, they're just not sure if they're ready to give something up. There's a lot of nostalgia connected to our belongings. Um, and you know, some people have a lot of, uh, I don't know if you, this is probably not any of you, but some people you know probably have a little bit of guilt about the purchasing that they do do. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that. We have a lot of societal <laughs> pressure to purchase. I grew up in the 80s. It was my civic duty. It was my national duty to purchase things in the 80s, right? And that's the childhood that I had. Um, so I did my duty. I thought I was doing the right thing. Uh, but now, when you, if you need to move, if you need to make some kind of change in your life, sometimes it can come up on you rather suddenly, and you realize, wow, that's a lot of stuff in my attic that I've accumulated all these years, decades. Or my kids left them behind, or that relative who asked if I could hold on to her record collection for a few years. 15 years ago, I now have her record collection in my attic. Beautiful collection. Um, but how do we, get, how, how do we let, it, let these things go? Well, it has not always, well, let me just uh, a little bit more about um, defining waste, first of all, because we have not always had waste, believe it or not. Waste, these are sort of modern examples of waste, that shopping that I was talking about. Shopping gives us a little bit of a jolt of positive energy. Um, we, uh, sometimes we repurpose waste easily. We've all been on a tire swing at some point in our lives. Some of us don't even know all the times that we've reused things from, from past generations. Um, but you know that sandwich that you ate one minute and then put in the trash the next minute, that was a, a, an object that you purchased. And then the next minute, when you didn't want it anymore, the second half of it went in the trash. All of a sudden, it's disgusting. And this is so true. We see this with kids at Arlington High School and in the elementary schools. Um, once something goes in a trash can, it's just too gross to touch. It's just too yucky. So if you made a mistake and you put your sandwich in the, in the recycling by accident, you were supposed to put it in the compost, which they're doing at the high school, it's very hard for them to reach their hands in and actually touch that sandwich that you know, a few minutes ago they paid for and were putting in their mouths. So, um, so sometimes trash is just becomes trash in an instant. So how can I say that there was never always trash? Well, we can think back to human history when we had fewer possessions. We didn't have big box stores. 
We didn't need 18 changes of clothing or 16 pairs of sneakers. Um, we had uh, people who lived much closer to the land, people who lived in, uh, we, our ancestors, were more agricultural. We put everything to use. Nothing was wasted, as, as Patsy explained in some of her examples. What you didn't eat went to your animals. Human beings have always been very codependent on animals. Um, and then in our, uh, uh, in our history all over the world, in pre-industrial times, um, there were objects were to be valued deeply and not th thrown away easily. In fact, you might be buried with them if you were very important. So I think we can all relate to this, the image on the bottom right too of the of a, of a older person in our family. I know I inherited a few quilts from my grandmother. Um, again, back to that nostalgia. These are really hard things to, to get rid of if they become at the end of their lives because they carry history. They carry the history of someone's shirt or someone's dress that they wore when they were young. So again, this emotional part, and this contributes to my argument that really we have not always had trash. So where did trash come from? It came from, it came from uh, moving into cities. It came from um, having limited space. It came from industrial practices. It came from manufactured goods. It came from disconnecting human beings from a natural environment, from living in an urban place where the streets are, are busy with uh, vehicles and we needed to have our trash be farther, placed farther and farther away from us, of course, often for very important public health reasons. Um, but we've also, since we've started creating waste, we have also saved that waste and held on to it and repurposed it. And wartime is a great example of that. It, as far back as the Revolutionary War, metal was recovered to be smelted and made back into um, uh, artillery. So war is always a great mechanism, as we know, for progress, for uh, technical progress and industrial progress. It's also been played an important role in helping human beings um, hold on to things and really rethink how does this thing, does this object only have one chance at a life or can we give it another kind of a life? So we're now in the 1940s. Um, really there were, there, this was how people got rid of their trash or they burned it in the backyard as, as Patsy uh, explained. There were people whose whole jobs and industries where people would recover um, materials like the rag man, um, uh, families whose um, family business evolved maybe later but started out really as a resource recovery kind of a uh, business. So here in Arlington, as Patsy pointed out, we had um, landfills. Landfills really didn't exist until um, this era, this post-industrial or this, in, 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 this uh, war, Second World War uh, era. This is um, not Arlington, Massachusetts landfill. There, are, I couldn't find a historical picture of the Arlington landfill, so I beg you today to help me find that. If any of you are archivists, I think that would be a fascinating thing to see. They must be out there, but I couldn't find them with my, with my uh, basic, rather basic uh, search. Uh, this is Arlington, Virginia. But a modern, a modern, a modern land, landfill or dump um, looks very much like it did in the past. I think the things that probably have changed over the years is that the trucks that roll over and smush the trash and break it up have probably gotten bigger and heavier and stronger. But it's the same basic idea. When we don't have a use for those materials, the only place we have, well, the original place that we thought to do with it, either burning it in the backyard, was to put to dig, big, dig a big hole and bury it and then cover it up. So in Arlington, we had um, mostly uh, the dumps that the, the uh, landfills, this, that's the more technical term, um, that, we, that we had in Arlington uh, were uh, near Poets Corner on Route 2. And that's the, bot, that's the, the, the uh, mark on the left. And then the top one is the, what was called the Berkeley Dump, and now McLennan Park, as you're all familiar. And um, these are registered as having closed at different times. There were four, I guess, uh, landfills in the town of Arlington. Um, they're all inactive and closed, you'll be glad to know. Um, the first one closed in 1947, and the last one closed in 1971. 
Has anybody been here that long in 19, 1971, living in town? Do people remember going to the, to the dump, to the landfill? Was it a place that, that, that residents went to? Yeah? About this time, around 1972, is when I have a first memory of recovering um, recycling in my uh, hometown, which was outside of New York City, and going uh, with my mom to smash bottles at, at the recycling area. Um, but I don't think there was recycling like that quite a, a, a here. But I wanted, one environmental thing I wanted to point out here, because of course all of the repercussions of what we've done in the past live with us today. <laughs> and none of our, our um, landfills are lined. So a modern landfill would be lined. And this would be a way to manage um, how, when, when our materials are decomposing, how they are affecting, for example, groundwater supply. Uh, we also have the problem of methane gas that it collects in landfills and is managed or not in landfills, depending on the ages of the landfills. Um, and methane gas is a very strong greenhouse gas. So again, that, that uh, idea that what we, what, the best solutions that we had when we, ha when we developed them um, nowadays would have, be, have been designed a little differently, and we are living now with some of the repercussions of those. One, one nice thing is that you can cap a landfill, and we have great parks in Arlington on top of our landfills. Uh, in Lexington, there's a great solar farm on top of one of their landfills. Solar farms and parks are very common things to go on top of a landfill. Um, so um, in a second option with trash, and this was uh, something that uh, I guess the, I don't, when was the first? The first uh, incinerator in the U.S. was built actually in 1885, according to Wikipedia, on, in Governor's Island in New York. And, and an incinerator can be just a big smokestack. We've all seen them coming in and out of cities. But this is a waste to energy facility. This is a, mo a more modern version of an incinerator. And this actually does create uh, electricity. And uh, this is from uh, the, the incinerator that our trash goes to. It's been going, we've been going there for quite a while. It uh, was built in 1985, and it is called Wheelabrator North Andover. It's been taken over a few times. Now it's called Wynn Industries. It's a great tour. I sometimes am able to run tours there. It's fascinating. And um, what it's doing is it's um, capturing as much of the toxins as it can. A lot of the materials that are, have been in our trash over the generations have included mercury. Mercury is very uh, dangerous when it comes back down as rain. It's a big problem. Um, so before we had uh, modern incinerators and we were, had old-fashioned incinerators, we really didn't know what the environmental implications were of burning our trash. So that was, that was up to the 1960s. And then um, we had some laws passed, 1970, what was that? Would anybody know what that law was called? 1970, the first one? Clean, Clean Air Act. And two years later was Clean Water, Clean Water Act. And so this, this, is really, this is really when we leapt into an environmental era. And we started to realize how much damage we were doing to the environment without uh, taking, without understanding fully the technology that we were using. So, um, Wheelabrator, I don't have a picture of it right now, but Wheelabrator is, um, uh, was built in 1985 by over 20 communities had to get together to build, to build Wheelabrator. Does anybody remember that being in the news? It was a big deal. It was a really big deal. It was a big commitment by the town of Arlington to participate as one of those communities. And uh, it was expensive, and it was going to solve a lot of problems for us. It was going to give us a place to take our trash. But it had this really strange, perverse incentive, which is that we had to commit to creating and not creating, but we had to uh, commit to supplying a certain amount of tons of trash every year. Because they needed that much to guarantee that they had enough feedstock of trash to create the electricity that they were hoping to also make some profit on. And that's the way waste energy works. You burn the trash, but you recover the energy by by uh, creating steam and running a generator to make electricity. Wheelabrator uh, powers 20,000 homes with electricity. So that's, that's not nothing, that's something. 
Um, but good thing we have clean air and clean water laws in place because even with modern technology of incineration, there are a lot of concerns. We're really only reducing our trash by 90%. The other 10% is ash, like in your fireplace or your, your uh, summer barbecue pit. So that ash has to go, it has to be managed very carefully with a lot of environmental regulation in place. And things can always go wrong. You've probably heard news stories about things going wrong. So I know I'm getting very depressing sounding right now, but I think this is what, I think it's what you all would expect about in a talk about trash and waste and waste diversion. We're gonna to get to more diversion soon. Um, but it is important to know where your trash goes. First to an incinerator, and then the ash goes to landfill. Now in Massachusetts, it's very important to know that we have a law that has capped, has, has disallows us to build any more incinerators in the state. So that means, and we have no more, oh, did I forget to mention? We have no more landfills. All the landfills are closed. I think there's one or two that have a couple more years left on them, not around here. So what's gonna happen to our trash when the incinerators break, which they will, they'll come to the end of their useful life and there's no plan to make a law to say, sure, we'll just build another incinerator. That doesn't really match with our net zero goals as uh, this still creates carbon uh, emissions. And as hopefully many of you have heard, we have, we have pledged as a, as a town and also as a state to become um, uh, carbon neutral by 2050. So that is something that we are actually legislated to reach, which means that we have to watch how much trash we create as a state and get it constantly have the pressure pushed down on creating trash and therefore creating emissions. So what happens when the incinerators break or they go down or the, for servicing or they end, reach their end of useful life? What are some of the other options? Does anybody want to take a guess what's going to happen to our trash next? What's on the horizon for, for Arlington and all of Massachusetts? We're going to send it on trains to other states for them to put it in their landfills. It doesn't disappear. I'm sorry. I really wish I could tell you there was and a way where we could put all of our junk. But we're going to ship it to other states where they have more space for landfills. So this is a this has just happened. I remember that anybody remember this in the news that this uh, it didn't end up being an environmental crisis, but this uh, train derailment was was scary because of course we had that horrible trail, trail derailment. Uh, so we can only imagine with tra tra more train and tra more and more train derailments in the news. This is going to become less and less palatable to the public. Luckily, the state of Massachusetts has goals to help us reduce our trash, lots of incentive programs, and one of them is, of course, um, to reduce our trash through recycling, waste diversion. So in Massachusetts, we have, there it says, six landfills left. They're almost done. So um, Massachusetts has waste ban laws on the books. And this is a progressive policy. Not, not, not that many states have this kind of public policy to help reduce the amount of trash that we make. And they, these um, started um, uh, a number of years ago, and, but we're continuing to make new laws, new waistbands to help push down the amount of trash that we make. So you probably know if you have a refrigerator or uh, an air conditioner or a stove or an oven, you can't put those in the trash. They have to get separated, and that's state law. So we also have construction demolition debris, hazardous waste. These are things by state law we are not allowed to include in, in solid waste. So that's, that's good. So what about the other recycling that we think of all the time? Um, why, why is that blank? Oh, there we go. It's because I made it a fun interactive slide. So <laughs> um, Earth Day in 1970 was really the birth of sort of a modern awareness of our, uh, and the, of the environmental effects of our waste production. Um, so this is when um, a new industrial mechanism was built. It's called a Material Recovery Facility, or a MRF. And that's just a diagram. It's a multi-level giant um, set of uh, conveyor belts and magnets and eddy currents and optical eyes that can see what kind of plastic that is and it will puff this way if it's a water bottle and puff that way if it's a laundry detergent bottle and puff that way if it's a milk jug because those different kinds of plastics all have to be sorted back out from each other. 
So this is, the, this is a, a modern miracle. We now have curbside recycling. Now you can put all of your recycling in a single container, and then when you send it to the MRF, they're going to separate it all out into different commodities. Because what we have to remember about recycling is that is it the, the beginning of a remanufacturing process. We're creating raw materials to be made into something else. So this sounds like a solution to all the problems of where we're going to put our trash, right? We could just recycle everything. But unfortunately, not everything is, was designed, not all kinds of, I'm going to use a word here that's a very important word, not all kinds of packaging was designed to be recycled. So um, your soda cans, aluminum is infinitely recyclable. Paper, paper products, extremely recyclable for a long time. And then as they get um, more and more recycled, the fibers get shorter because it's a, it's, it's a growth from a tree. The fibers get shorter, it can be made into lower quality paper products, cardboard, tissue paper, things like that. So some, some of our materials can get recycled quite a number of times. Um, but a plastic chip bag is not designed to be recycled. And we have a lot of those flying around. And we also know the environmental consequences of having this light packaging that can't be recycled floating around in our natural environment. So um, let's see. There is a lot of news about recycling. And it is not often very good news. And it's very disturbing for people like me who work in a community like Arlington to have people call me and say, well, you know, I just heard on the news that it's not really a thing. Recycling is not really happening. And I asked them, well, you're, now you're talking to the Arlington Recycling Coordinator. Do you think I would lie to you? <laughs> there is some bad news. Globally, recycling, like oil, like corn, like pork bellies, <laughs> are a commodity. It is, it is something that's floating around the world, getting shipped from places where recycling is created, like in Arlington and cities and urban areas, to places where manufacturing is happening. What kind of manufacturing is happening in Arlington? Well, maybe we should start some. <laughs> because wouldn't it be great if we, could keep, if we could keep all of our yogurt containers and our laundry detergent bottles right here in Arlington? But as we can imagine, you know, that's probably not going to happen. But the new environmental uh, policies from other parts of the world have created more manufacturing opportunities in this country and even in Massachusetts. So there is actually recycling going on within the state of Massachusetts. There's a company called Preserve in Lemonster. Really, Lemonster has a lot of plastic recycling um, companies. And they will purchase this material from the big commodities market. They will put it into their new plastic products. And they will sell it back to you happily. And that is a huge emission savings. When we are not extracting raw materials from the earth and we are reusing these this material that we have already used, but only once usually, let's use it again and again. And um, I can guarantee you that recycling is happening. So this is a picture of the material recovery facility. Um, and it's just really, these small pictures are hard, but I think the most interesting one is the top right one with the um, forklift and a big bale of recycling. That's, that's what they're selling. So they charge us to drop off our recycling and then they sort it all out, and then they bail it up like that, and they put it on big trucks, and they sell it. There is a market for recycling. And when people say they're not really sure recycling is happening, what I've come to realize after doing this for about a decade is that what people really mean is plastics. Because I think we can all understand how aluminum becomes alum another aluminum can, and how paper becomes cardboard or paper again, because we buy recycled paper, right? We're, we're contributing to that process of remanufacturing by, by going to Staples and saying, OK, I'm going to buy the recycled paper. It's 10 cents more, but I'm going to buy it anyway. You're contributing to a healthy remanufacturing of materials. So yay you. And if you don't do it yet, you can start today. <laughs> Just look out for the recycle to see that it's made from recycled material. Um, so um, the. Since we know that plastic packaging is so confusing and so much of it is not recyclable, it's true. Like I said, those chip bags and a lot more is not recyclable. We have great news for you. The state of Massachusetts is leading in this. And they got together with all those material recovery facilities that there are in Massachusetts. There are only eight or nine. They got them all together at a table, which is really hard to do with people in a competitive industry, as you can imagine. And they said, 
All right, seriously, guys, what is recyclable? And that's what we present to you. This is, this is what I present to you, Recycle Smart MA. Any community in Massachusetts can sign on to these rules. Many, many have, and Arlington did in a number of years ago. So the rules are the same in Arlington as in Mashapee, as in Pembroke, as in uh, Amherst. We have the same set of rules. You do not have to relearn a whole new set of roles, rules if you go visit your sister-in-law in, you know, I don't know, Holden, right? You don't have to learn no, no, another set of rules. We had this hopefully clearly on the town's website. We tried to uh, make it available in paper form for people who like it. It's still confusing because these pictures aren't actually all that great and there's still a lot of questions. But if you can remember that bottles, jars, jugs and tubs from your kitchen or your bathroom on your laundry, that's your recyclable plastic. If you have a telephone that you wanna recycle, it's made of plastic. This is a lot of plastic in this phone. But this is not designed to be recycled, and it's definitely not designed to be recycled at the curbside, in your curbside recycling program. So we have to make some compromises. We have to spend some energy sorting out our trash from our recycling in order for that to be uh, a material. But just think back to your ancestors who were sorting out rags and horsehair. Horsehair was something that was recovered. Burlap sacks were recovered. Um, these were valuable things that could be made into something else. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's confusing. I admit it's confusing. So try to simplify, simplify it for yourself and forgive yourself if you get it wrong. But we, what we don't want to do is over recycle, like putting a phone in your recycling bin or um, a wire hanger just because it's metal does not go in your recycling bin. We don't want to over recycle because that sorting facility is only designed for certain kinds of materials, those kinds, and that's it. So um, in order to make this searchable, there is a cool link on our website called Recyclepedia. You can plug in, you know, all those takeout containers that you're confused about. You can plug it in there and it will show you pictures and even explain to you why or why not it's recyclable. Again, it's recyclable if it can be made into something new. And it can only be made into something new if it can be safely collected and sorted and there's a market for it. Someone's going to buy it to make it into something new. That's just economics. We can't, we can't make people make something from something else. Um, so moving to today, um, as Patsy mentioned, we do have some programs that we think are, help, are helping with forward thinking. Um, we can't recycle ourselves out of the problem of having so much waste, having all of our food products that we're just going to the grocery store to buy dinner supplies, and we can't help it. We're attacked by the plastic packaging, the variety of plastic packaging coming at us. It's really, 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 really hard to avoid. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're working on more and more uh, programs, um, but the drop-off programs that are available to you include things like a plastic telephone. When this is recycled as electronic waste, that plastic is entering a different it's not going to a material recovery facility, it's going to a different stream of remanufacturing. It's going to the electronic waste stream. And there are lots of materials in here that can be recycled and plastic can be chipped up and melted into new things. Um, we have reuse programs. Uh, we'd love to encourage a lot of the reuse that you probably see around in your, if you're on social media at all. A, a Facebook Marketplace, everything is free. It used to, used to just be Craigslist or uh, FreeCycle, but now you can really give away just about anything in Arlington. And we have a fabulous ethos in Arlington that using something that someone else is getting rid of is a good thing. Um, not everybody feels that way. Not everybody in this room probably feels that way, but a lot of people in Arlington are very, very happy to reuse. And we're really, really happy as a town to help make that happen. It's a win-win-win situation. Um, to reduce packaging, so we have some cool things. I don't know if you guys have been to the Yes Plastic Free store in Arlington. Okay, we got, a, we got an applause over there. That's a great place if you really wanna take some next steps at reducing plastic packaging because they can help you refill your soft soap container next to your, next to your uh, sink or uh, sell you, um, laundry soap or dishwashing soap in, uh, in bulk. 
So that's a fabulous resource if you want to take an individual step. As a community, we're really promoting composting because that's the heaviest thing in your trash. And now, imagine you're a sloppy, wet, like let's say I made a fruit salad. Such a yummy thing. I've got all my fruit salad stuff. I've got my peach skin, my, my cantaloupe rind, my apple cores, my, you know, and my everything is sitting there for a couple hours and getting nice and juicy and wet. And then I'm going to put it in my, imagine putting that mushy, wet, yummy stuff into an incinerator. What is it going to do to the incinerator? If it goes with my trash, it's going to go into the incinerator. It's going to negate the heat potential of my incinerator. Now, if I have a bunch of um, wood, sh wood sh shavings from my, I've just taken up a wood uh, spoon carving. If I put those in my trash, that the incinerator will love that because that's going to burn fast and hot and make electricity. So not even the incinerators want your food waste. They don't want it. We don't want it because Arlington pays per ton. And about 25% of our tonnage is probably food scraps. So this would be a really good thing for uh, the, our bottom line and for the environment. When you can take those yummy peelings from your fruit salad and put them into a controlled composting environment, you are making, you are adding nutrition to the soil. And if you didn't know it, you are 100% uh, thankful that the soil exists because you couldn't exist without it, right? We have to all be really careful with our soils. Um, if any of you, I know there are plenty of gardeners in here, I know them personally, um, you know firsthand, but any of you who eat, do any of you eat? <laughs> all right, so you also like the soil and need, need healthy soils. Um, and then we're always looking for new materials. It would be really great to um, have a paint take back day, for example. Paint is, is basically liquid plastic, and we would love to get that out of the trash because if you don't, have, if you're not holding on to it in your basement because you don't know how to get rid of it, and if we can find a way to get it out of your basement faster, like right after you finish that paint job, that paint can actually be reused. It can be remixed. This is happening in the states all around us. There are great programs that take back paint, so you don't have to have it in your basement, and it can be on walls, and probably we can pay le less for it, right? So we're looking at all kinds of things, both as a state of Massachusetts, but also as a town of Arlington. So here's a, my plug for food scrap diversion. Um, if you're not a composter, that's fine. Not everybody's into it. Um, a lot of people are afraid of critters in their backyard, or they have no perp, they have no use for it. But since we all eat, we've established that. Um, you can subscribe to food scrap diversion programs at the curb. It's not the same as when you used to be able to put the, does anybody remember the little metal thing the little in your yard and you put that in there and then the, the hog guy would come along and take your food scraps? We're basically going back to the beginning, people. But now we're giving you a plastic container and you have to pay, sorry. <laughs> it's not as good as it was. Nothing is quite as good as it was in the past, but we are trying to relearn from the past. There were really good, I mean, uh, you know, our grandparents, they didn't need to think about compost. They didn't need to think, to think about what's happening to their food scraps. They probably didn't buy too much. <laughs> they probably cooked and ate it all. Um, but since we do buy too much and we don't eat it all, we have to have a composting solution. So uh, consider that program. Then other new things, things that really were not a problem in the past but are a problem today is we have way too many clothes in the world. And they're made very quickly. They're made very inexpensively. Um, we, we don't need to have as many clothes as we do have but we have this problem of too many clothes. So the state of Massachusetts, in all its wisdom, have now banned you from putting textiles, so that's clothes, shoes, luggage, sheets, towels, they've banned you from putting it in the trash. So I ask your help, because I can't come to every trash can and check through and make sure that you've put a t-shirt in there you weren't supposed to. So tell all of your friends and neighbors, this started just last November, but textiles are a, a decent percentage of our, of our trash weight as a, as a state. And so we now have um, lots of bins to drop off like we used to. Everyone's got their favorite organization that they're already donating to. You don't have to change your behavior at all. Just remember that if you have the really, really worn sheets and towels that you think no one's going to want, even those are recyclable. But you don't have to wrap them up nicely and, and bring them to Goodwill if you don't want to. So they'll take them too. You can now do a curbside program. Um, I'll, I'll let you more, know more about that, or it's on our website. You can just put them in a bag on a Wednesday with an appointment that you make online, and they'll pick it up for you. We just want to get all of those old sheets and towels, curtains, pillows out of the trash. 
So we ask that you remember to recycle them. And mattresses. But that's another story. But mattresses are no longer allowed in the trash either, also as of November 1st last year. So other activities that, again, will probably remind you of your grandparents, uh, we can fix things. Did you know that? We can actually fix some things, not everything. But fixing is something that can be done. And we're starting to have more and more events where we coach people, people who are really good with their hands, like a Chuck, might help someone like me who's a little nervous to open something up, um, give me some confidence to look to open something up, see if we can, you know, tweak this, tweak that, rewrap that, change the wiring, and we can fix a lot of things. We just had a swap, uh, a fix-it clinic on Saturday at Robbins Library, and it was very successful. We fixed a lot of things. It was really fun, and everyone's learning, and everyone's getting less afraid of opening up their scary electronic things. We've, uh, we always have um, giving away, too. I know that probably a lot of people here have made donations, and uh, there are a li lot of great organizations out there. I'll put a pitch in for um, if any of you are downsizing in the next few years, um, Household Goods in, in Acton is a furniture bank for um, people who really are, they don't have anything for their home, uh, whether it's their uh, refugees or they're fleeing domestic violence or they've had a fire. So they get to come and pick a whole house full of furniture, and it would be furniture donated by residents such as you. So um, if you want to find out more about that, check out Household Goods in Acton. Really fabulous organization. So on the right is the picture of the squirty bottles to refill your hand soap at the Yes Plastic Free store. Um, that's one way that people are reducing their single-use plastic. And this is becoming more and more of a thing. You probably have, you know, a child or a niece or you know, someone in your neighborhood who is really into this. You know, the real environmentalists are trying to figure out how to not use plastic at all. It's practically impossible. But um, pl banning plastic bags, banning styrofoam in towns like Arlington, which we've done, um, uh, saying no thank you when you get takeout to the spoon and the fork that comes with the meal. These are things that our Zero Waste Committee is working to help build more public awareness and participation in. Um, so there, these are sort of the everyday things that you can do to reduce plastic in your own lives, especially that single-use plastic. You know, you, we all have to have a phone. We all have to have, you know, certain things. We, a television. I love TV. We all have, we're all going to have a TV. There's a lot of plastic in TV. That's okay because you're not using it once and throwing it away. But all those things you are using once and throwing away, we, we can rethink that. Um, this is a company that I mentioned before le in Lemonster that recycles um, number five plastic, which is your yogurt cups or your margarine tubs or your um, cottage cheese tubs, into durable plastic that you can use. You can, if you have an environmentalist in your life and you'd like to buy them a present, you can buy them a preserve, a preserve item and you can get those, I think, at Whole Foods. So uh, a plug for thinking about what you're purchasing, using your um, consumer power to support the, recyc the recycling um, mechanism, sort of extracting from the earth, using something, figuring out a way to make it into something else and use it again. Keep it in that loop before we have to put it in the trash for its final resting. So this is just a little picture of our um, website. We have EcoFest coming up, which is going to be a whole month of um, activities around town, litter cleanups, park cleanups. Um, there's Swap Shed's going to be opening a lot more this spring. We just had a paper shredding event, but we have another one coming up in May. Everybody loves a good paper shredding event. And um, we have the, uh, the guide to download there. That little, that little symbol is my download the calendar here. There are a lot of things going on all the time. If you want to pick up a hard copy of the calendar, I have them up here right now. And, um, you know, we really try to, this is, the website is really the way that we can put out information fast. We can make up a new event and put it on the website. I try to get in town notices too. Um, and we know that not everybody loves going onto the website and be, being asked to go to the website to look something up. So you can always just call. Just call and say, when's the next shredding event? Um, but if you, are, if you do like using email and it's useful, do sign up for town notices because that's your number one way to get the top button issues that are going on in town. And if there's a paper shredding event, you will just get an email saying, there's a paper shredding event in three weeks. Put it on your calendar, and you're good to go. So that's what I have in terms of slides and presentation. Thank, thank you for your questions and attention.